Sorry, I've been making the openings to my videos so cheesy lately. Greetings one and all, and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. In today's video, I'll be presenting my latest episode of Tom's A to Z my monthly series in which I chronicle my alphabetical exploration of House of Records' $1 LP section. Yes, one album by one artist representing almost every letter of the alphabet from A to Z. Uh, two albums per video, so today we are up to the letters I and J. Uh, yes, and by the way, I know that my last A to Z was not some of my best work. I will totally own up to that. Uh, it was just, yeah, I just couldn't figure out a whole lot to say about those uh, albums. I thought about redoing the video before uploading it, but, uh, you know, I don't know if I could have done any better, frankly. I, I don't know if I just wasn't in the right headspace or what was going on, but uh, it's not that I didn't like those two albums, as I mentioned in that video. I just couldn't figure out a whole lot to say about them. Uh, but in this pair of albums, I think I will have more to say about them. So, what might these two albums be? I'm sure you're asking yourself by now. Let's go ahead and check them out, shall we? Uh, first of all, representing the letter I in this year's cycle of Tom's A to Z is Los Indios Tabajaras. This is a folk guitar duo from Brazil, uh, comprised of two brothers, and uh, as is the case with most of the albums in my A to Z this year, I've never heard of these guys before. Uh, they started out way back in the 1940s, and they've been putting albums out since the 1950s. Uh, legend has it they learned how to play guitar by discovering one, uh, finding one on the street. Of course, there's no way to verify that, uh, partly because they're both dead. Uh, one of them passed away in 1997, and the other one passed away in 2009, I think it was. So, uh, but yeah, this is, um, they released several albums before this one. This is not their first or second or even their third album. And I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, the guitar work is fantastic, as you, as I'm sure you can probably imagine, being Brazilian guitar players particularly. They, they, just, they just seem to have, you know, musicians from Brazil just seem to have something to them. And it, it's uh, all instrumental. There's no vocals, unless you count the chorus. There's a, you know, chorus in the background. And that was one thing that kind of... Uh, made me balk a little bit at picking up this album. It's uh, The album's title, by the way, is Their Very Special Touch, and as you can see here, it's accompanied by orchestra and chorus. So I was afraid that the guitar work was going to be, you know, kind of drowned out by the uh, background orchestra and stuff. But no, they the guitars are pretty much front and center, and it's very good melodies. Uh, these songs are pretty much uh, stuff that's popular in America. American songbook standards, uh, stuff from show tunes and stuff that, you know, things that... Uh, American audiences are familiar with, and this was an American release, so that kind of uh, figures. They wanted to cater to the, uh, their audience, obviously. Uh, Sentimental Journey, Strangers in the Night, uh, What a Difference a Day Made, and Unchained Melody. You get the ideas. A bunch of other stuff. Uh, Play a Simple Melody. That's a song that I, I was, I'm familiar with, the Bing Crosby version, and I'm sure a bunch of other artists recorded that, too. It's a very fun song, cute song. And uh, so, yeah, but this is, it's a very, very enjoyable album. Uh, as I said, the orchestra and chorus is not tr too intrusive on the brothers' guitar work. And I believe they're all uh, done with uh, um, acoustic guitars. There are no electric guitars in here, uh, which, of course, adds to the beauty. I mean, acoustic guitars. And there's one or two songs on here that almost sound like they're ukuleles. And as far as I know, they are, they are playing guitars throughout every track. I don't think they play ukulele on any of the tracks. All of the... the uh, liner notes in albums from the 60s, yeah, 1967 is when this album was released. The liner notes are not terribly extensive as to instrumental credits and all that, uh, but yes, a very enjoyable album, um, as you might, uh, as might be implied by the fact that I said some, a uh, couple of tracks sounded like ukuleles, some of them have a, uh, an island element, a Hawaiian Islands element, or a South Pacific element. Uh, other songs, naturally being Brazilian, have a Latin guitar uh, sound to them, and there are some other tracks that sound a little bit more Americanized. Uh, this is a good album, but I am kind of interested in, th in seeking out some of their other stuff, the stuff where maybe they are not backed by an, or by an orchestra or chorus, and perhaps stuff that is traditional Brazilian or Latin American or South American tunes. I'd like to hear what they do with that kind of stuff. So, But yeah, this was a, ver a very good uh, first impression on Los Indios Tabajaras. Uh, you might want to check them out. And uh, when I looked on the Wikipedia page, uh, they had re they had kept on recording albums into the the eighties or possibly even the nineties. Uh, but this is the only album that I've ever checked out or seen. Uh, not that I've gone looking for their other albums. Not that I can go looking right now. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, 
interested to check out, as I said, more of their stuff. So yeah, very good first introduction to that uh, little-known guitar group, uh, at least uh, little-known in the States. And now moving on to the letter J, we have Michael Johnson with the very aptly titled The Michael Johnson Album. Now, I don't know if this has ever happened uh, to you guys, any of you out there, but it's happened to me, and it actually happened to me with this artist. I'm going through the record racks, I see his record and think, shouldn't I know this guy? It's like I get a feeling of deja vu when I see him. I see his face. His face doesn't necessarily look familiar, but its I guess it's just the name. its He's got a general enough name that's like, shouldn't I know this guy? Should this guy seem familiar? But then yet when you look at the uh, track listing, none of the song titles sound familiar. Uh, but yeah, th that's what I got, as I said, when I saw this guy in the racks. So I decided to go ahead and pick him up and brought him home. But uh, yeah, I, apparently this was kind of an unfounded feeling of deja vu because this was his most successful album and it hit, it hit only number 81 on the uh, album charts. But this was his fourth album. He actually put out uh, his first album back in the... I forgot to note the year that his first album came out. But it was co-produced by Phil Ramone as well as Peter Yarrow, who was uh, familiar from Peter, Paul, and Mary. He was the Peter in Peter, Paul, and Mary. And he actually got his start back in the 60s when he was briefly part of a group alongside John Denver. So yes, he and John Denver were, were in a group together. But yes, this was, as I said, I think I, think I said, his fourth album. And uh, his two biggest hits were actually on this album. His hit, biggest hit singles, they both hit top 40. Uh, Bluer Than Blue, which is uh, his most popular, I think, as well as Almost Like Being In Love. And those two were uh, both on this album. But uh, as you can kind of tell by the album cover, or maybe it's just me, uh, maybe the back cover will kind of help too. Uh, this guy is kind of what I was expecting. A very uh, 70s AM radio pop rock singer-songwriter kind of stuff. Kind of like a Kind of like James Taylor. In fact, uh, his voice actually reminds me a lot of James Taylor. Maybe it's just because of this. It's got the same sonic palette, covers the same kind of territory as James Taylor did back in the 70s. Uh, but there are other songs on this album in which his voice kind of reminds me of Lionel Richie. So he's got, you know, just a, maybe a bit, a very, very slight hint of R&B in his songs, too. But yeah, a very good, nice set of songs. Very, as I said, mellow. Uh, Easy, easy on the ears kind of 70s pop rock stuff. Very pleasant stuff, and uh, as I think I said, the, his two biggest hits, Bluer Than Blue and Almost Like Being In Love, were on this album. A couple of other great songs are Dancing Tonight, which is kind of catchy, maybe slightly cheesy. That's kind of uh, doing it a disservice, honestly. You know, honestly, for you know, 1978, as, this, as I said, this album was released in 1978. You know, for the time, it probably wasn't all that cheesy. It may not have aged well as well as some other stuff out there. Let's put it that way. So so as not to disparage Michael Johnson as being a cheesy artist, he's not. This album was, as I said, very enjoyable. And another great, very bouncy, very catchy song on here is 25 Words or Less. That's a very cool one. And But yeah, pretty much every song on here was uh, pretty nice. Foolish and, uh, let's see, uh, When You Come Home, I think, are a couple of the very of the better ballads on here. And he also does a cover of Gypsy Woman, which I think Santana did. Uh, Curtis Mayfield wrote it, and I believe Santana covered Gypsy Woman. Uh, but yeah, very, very good set of songs on here. Uh, if you're in the mood for some very easy, easy listening, not easy listening strictly in the strictest sense, but easy going, soft pop, soft rock from the 70s, has, has a very 70s mellow sound to it. Check out Michael Johnson. And he actually, after this album, well, he put out a few more albums in the pop rock vein, but then later on he went into country. So he, he became a country artist later on. So, And I don't know if he's still recording or not, but uh, yeah, he's he put out quite a few albums, uh, more than a dozen albums, I think, uh, over the years. So, uh, And I'm thinking I might uh, check him out uh, a little bit more, maybe. But uh, yeah, very enjoyable stuff. The Michael Johnson album, check it out if it's on Spotify. Maybe it is, I don't know. Well, I guess that will do it for A to Z for this month. I hope I did these two albums justice by talking more about them in a manner that made them sound intriguing to you. Uh, I, I, I kind of hate that my last video was short on that. I hope this video made up for it. I, I, don't, I like to give you guys quality content. I don't like to, you know, make it feel like I'm doing half-assed stuff. Uh, but yeah, the last video was just kind of unavoidable. It was, it was a weird week, as I mentioned in my last video. Just uh, maybe I just wasn't in the right headspace for that. But anyway... 
that'll do it as I said for A to Z for the month of May 2020 and that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms, lay them on me in the comment section below. Also scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.